We are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Bob Hasegawa. Bob Hasegawa is a longtime labor and social justice activist. For 32 years, he was a member of the Teamsters Union, where he rose through the ranks to become the elected leader of the largest Teamsters trucking local workers uh, union in the Pacific Northwest, and was also a leader in the National Teamsters Pro-Union Democracy Reform Movement. And he is currently serving his third term in the Washington State Legislature, representing District 11. Bob, thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. It's actually the fourth term I'm in now. Oh, fourth. I'm yeah. sorry. I didn't get that Crazy right. Busy people had the That's good. Like to elect me in. <laughs> so, and you've been there since 2005? Yes. Okay. So, um, start out, uh, last year... You uh, co-sponsored a uh, bill, House Bill 3162, to create a state bank of Washington? Yes. Yeah. So talk about uh, the need for Washington State Bank and how that whole concept came about. Well, the whole concept started with a conversation about revenue reform, and we're trying to look at um, smart use of the taxpayers' money over the long term. And, uh, you know, there is one model that's been out there North Dakota, of all places, has uh, their own publicly owned uh, banking institution called the Bank of North Dakota. So working off of that model, it's been working quite well for North Dakota over the years. And uh, uh, the conversation turned, you know, because of the um, problems that we've been having with the banks since about 2008, 2007, eight. Um, we're looking at new innovative ways to think outside the box and how are we going to build some capital reserve for the state. You know, we have a $2 billion every year that we spend in debt service just to pay on loans, uh, bonds that we issue to keep capital construction moving in our state. Um, looking at the North Dakota model, um, their own bank finances most of their capital projects and you know construction is one of the best ways to get money on the ground right now uh, to keep the economy moving so uh, they North Dakota does not have a, a debt service problem uh, the bank finances all of theirs so that's like two billion dollars right there every year that is not spent on interest to Wall Street banks so our conversation turned to uh, looking at a new way of maybe doing things. And right now, when the state collects all of our tax revenue, it's primarily held at what we call a concentration account at the Bank of America. So essentially, the Bank of America gets to use our taxpayers' dollars and reap the profits from it. And the thinking is, why should we allow them to make money off of our money? Why don't we, as a state, make money off of our money and then we still control that money in the process, and then we can redirect it back into our local economies for economic development purposes. So it's just a smart way to do business and a smart way to use taxpayers' money so that it's benefiting taxpayers here. Kind of seems like a almost a crime that it's going to Bank of America, actually, <laughs> with all the problems that they've had and yeah, their, their yeah, leadership. Yeah, yeah, well, it, it, it's kind of a no-brainer deal, really. Uh, so what we're doing right now is... We've had a, a couple of hearings uh, on the bills during the last legislative session. So there was a House Bill 1320, and then there was a Senate Companion Bill. I can't remember the number of that now. Uh, 5623, I think it was. Uh, so we had um, hearings, good hearings on those bills last legislative session. As a result of those hearings, uh, we have formed, the House has formed a task force this interim uh, to look at preparing a proposal for the 2012 legislature that hopefully will will be able to pass through the legislative session and that hopefully the governor will sign. So that task force had its first meeting last Monday. Uh, if you're interested, uh, it was uh, taped by uh, TVW, so it's on the TVW website. But uh, I'm very pleased with the caliber of the task force, the quality of the people and the experiences of the members of the task force, all of whom, um, they're either legislators or they are um, people who come from the banking industry, but who really are 
open-minded about seeing if we can really come up with a product that is doable through the legislature. So uh, we've, we've had our first meeting. It was basically an organizing meeting to lay the foundations and look at the type of work that we're going to be needing to do. Uh, but it's, it's a formidable task. You know, we're creating an institution, a humongous institution, and we have about five months to see where we can get with it. So we're moving forward. We'll be moving quickly on this stuff, but all of our hearings will be open. So if people want to come and observe and even comment on it, we'll have comment periods uh, during each session. So we can get feedback from how the public is um, looking at what we're trying to do too. So we're moving forward with it. It's very exciting. And people can follow that through your uh, website? Yes, yes. Uh, you can go to ledge.wa.gov. Um, I'm not exa I don't have the link with me right now, but um, all of the it's a regular committee of the House of Representatives, so there's a way to find the website. So how, in addition to just saving us or, or using that money that's now currently going to Bank of America that they're taking their cut out of and having that cut come back to the citizens here in Washington State, how else would a bank, a state bank, help, let's say, small businesses? Well, you know, you talk to any small, and that's this is one of the prime drivers of why we first started looking at this, because uh, when credit tightened, um, you know, there, if you talk to the banks, they'll say there's lots of money out there to be lent, uh, and that they are, in fact, lending it. But if you talk to any small business owner out there on the street, they'll say just the opposite. And in fact, um, there's been studies done, there's actually been conflicting studies, but uh, primarily the ones that I've been relying on, they'll interview small business owners and, and small business owners will say their number one issue is access to capital. So I've had small business owners and farmers, small farm owners come to my office literally on the verge of tears saying they're going to lose their farm just because they've been cut off uh, from access to credit for, by their banks and nothing had changed within their credit rating or their credit history. It's just that uh, the banks are saying the lending circumstances have tightened up, so uh, they don't want to make the same mistakes again, which is understandable. But that's a real drag on it, our economy because 75% of the jobs, uh, new jobs that are created in our economy are created by small businesses. And if they cannot get access to credit, uh, which every uh, small business owner has or every business owner has credit needs because um, you know your your uh, revenue and accounts receivables are always fluctuating, and if the rece receipts do not match your outlays, you need credit to to weather through that until your receipts do come in. Well, if you don't have that access, um, you're done. So one of the main things that the our own state bank can do is. It, following the model of North Dakota is uh, they, they partner with local commercial banks. Uh, they don't, the Bank of North Dakota does not compete with commercial banks, it actually partners with them. So it multiplies the available money that can be lent into the local economies and keeping small businesses and small farmers afloat. So that's a key piece for what we're trying to create is that we do not want to compete against the banks. Uh, what we want to do is partner with them to make sure that capital continues to flow into our communities. Okay, so and when you say banks, you mean the big banks that are here in Washington or let's say smaller community banks and our credit unions? Yeah, my concern is mostly for community banks, uh, small community banks, because they're the ones who are actually, they know their communities that they work in uh, that they operate in. They know the needs and the credit histories of the people in the community that need the loans. Um, large banks obviously do, um, are also in that same marketplace, but they have sufficient resources if they had wanted to. So by partnering uh, with those banks, whether they're community banks or big national banks, the end effect is that we'll be freeing up capital into the uh, small businesses and small farmer communities so that they can survive. One of the interesting things about North Dakota is North Dakota has a lot of firsts in the country. Um, I mentioned um, that they're the only 
uh, state in the country that does have its own bank. But one of the things that North Dakota has is they call it the most decentralized banking system in the country. In other words, they have the most banks and bank branches per capita of any state in the country, which means that um, the big banks haven't monopolized the marketplace, that there's a lot of local community banks in North Dakota. And so those are the types of banks that really understand the needs of local communities and, and what we can really support here. Another thing that's interesting about North Dakota is that it has the lowest unemployment rate in the country. Uh, not surprisingly, because it uh, does a great job in supporting uh, local small businesses, who I mentioned provide most of the jobs in an economy to begin with. Uh, North Dakota has another interesting first, which is that it's the only state in the country that had a budget surplus last year. So they had a budget surplus of uh, $1.1 .1 billion. Um, a lot of people say that that's because of their oil and gas revenues. North Dakota is very rich in oil and gas, and to a certain extent that is true. Um, that revenue does make help North Dakota uh, significantly. But when you add up all of the firsts that North Dakota does have, um, in another thing that North Dakota has had is no banking failures. Um, you know, the state of Washington, I think we're up to 15 banks that have failed since the credit crisis began, and there's another 20 or so that are on the bubble. And the reason for that is that the Bank of North Dakota acts as sort of a mini federal reserve for these banks, and they, it, it provides liquidity uh, for these local community banks. Banks, like any other business, have cash flow issues, too. So um, with all of these firsts that North Dakota does have, um, the one common factor amongst all of them is that they own their own bank. And uh, if you look at any developing country around the world, um, they all have publicly owned institution banking institutions themselves. Uh, so. You look at uh, Brazil, uh, China, India, Japan, they all have uh, their own state-funded banks. The United States is one of the few countries that actually doesn't have its own public bank uh, system. A lot of people think that the Federal Reserve is a publicly owned facility. It's actually not. It's the, the Federal Reserve is owned by the banks. So they, they provide capital back and forth to the bank. The Federal Reserve provides capital to the banks um, but it's not publicly owned, so their policies um, are, are governed, so to speak, by a combination of political will from the US, United States government, but also by what the banks want. So uh, there's a distinct difference between that and a publicly owned institution. So that's what we're trying to create is a little bit of independence from Wall Street for the state of Washington. So have you spoken with uh, representatives of some of the smaller community banks here in the state have, uh, about your idea? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> banks are uh, sort of across the board understandably skeptical about this concept because their main concern is competition. They, they don't want the uh, state-owned institution, which would have enormous leverage to compete directly against them because a state institution wouldn't be paying taxes. It doesn't pay taxes to itself. Uh, that could give uh, this institution a so-called unfair advantage. Um, so that's understandable. So that the, the main protection that we're trying to, to create um, some comfort level amongst the community bankers is that we do not want to compete. You know, we want to follow the Bank of North Dakota model as closely as possible which has proven to be a successful, successful model. They, the Bank of North Dakota was created in 1919 uh, in response to a credit crisis in North Dakota. Well, actually it was across the country back then. Um, they felt like their futures were out of their own control, that Wall Street and actually banks in Minneapolis and Minnesota were controlling North Dakotans' destiny. They wanted to be able to control their own destiny, and that was the impetus for creating their own bank. And I have to imagine they, there was a lot of resistance to that back when it happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of resistance to it. Um, 
The banks obviously didn't like it. They took it to the Supreme Court. Uh, but the Supreme Court said if North Dakotans want to create a bank, they should be allowed to create it. So it has been, um, it took some time because of that pushback by the uh, big credit institutions. Um, it, took, it took a while for the Bank of North Dakota to get rolling. But uh, it has played a significant role in the history of North Dakota. For instance, during the Great Depression, um, the bank acted as sort of a heat sink for the credit crunch that uh, the country was going through. Uh, so f for North Dakotans at the time, you know, the Dust Bowl era and whatnot, where there were no crops um, and people were just literally losing their farms, the Bank of North Dakota, which held the mortgages on a lot of those um, properties, um, well, the state of North Dakota actually declared a moratorium on for foreclosures. The state bank um, foreclosed on them on paper, but actually let the people stay on the properties and work their farms until they were able. the The economy turned around; they were able to raise the crops, and then the Bank of North Dakota sold those properties back to the original owners for the amount that the banks had in them. So it acted as that sort of um, heat sink to absorb the credit crunch issue until the farmers could get afloat again. So would the state bank also be working with the credit unions locally? Because I know that a lot of people who are moving their money into credit unions, uh, out of big banks into credit unions, because mm -hmm. that just seems like a safer thing mm -hmm. at this point. Well, the state bank wouldn't probably have any interaction with the credit unions at all. Um, following the North Dakota model, um, the bank, the state is the primary, primary depositor within the bank. So it would be the state's tax revenues would be the primary deposits for the bank. Now, North Dakota does have a policy uh, that the bank belongs to the people. So if the people want to keep their money at the bank, they should be entitled to, but they don't market it to the general public whatsoever. They just have a few hundred accounts, personal accounts, I think, there. Um, the, the Bank of North Dakota has one branch. It's in Bismarck. So if you want to do your business with the Bank of North Dakota, you have to be willing to go to where their branch is. Uh, I actually visited their, their bank. It's a beautiful facility. It's been making money for the state. Uh, they were able to build a brand new building recently. Uh, it's a beautiful building. There's a picture of it on the website, I believe. But um, they do not market to the general public, so they don't have ATMs scattered around the state. They don't uh, do credit cards necessarily for the general public, any of those that you would consider typical banking services for the retail public. Uh, its primary purpose is to be a depository for the state's tax revenues and to use that money wisely back to keep their local economies going. So how do you respond to people that say, what we need is less government. You know, the state bank is just going to be another large entity that's going to be controlling our money and, and sapping our, our resources away. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily buy into that whole concept of less government to begin with. I think you have to do, you have to right size government. So it's not just strictly about shrinking or eliminating. It's about doing what works best for, to achieve our common goal. And our common goal is, we want jobs for everybody. We want an, a social infrastructure, including education and safety net services that is adequate for the people. So, um, and, and by creating a, uh, our own state owned banking institution, um, it's, it's such smart government in the sense that um, we're using taxpayers' dollars for the best interests of the taxpayers and not to make profit for Wall Street. That's just one thing. The other thing that it does is um, it can consolidate a lot of government functions that we have right now that are, are separately administered. So we have the, the state actually does have a lot of lending programs going on right now. We've got the Public Works Trust Fund that that helps uh, finance local infrastructure development like building sewers and water systems, that sort of thing. We've got the Housing Trust Fund that uh, puts money into developing affordable housing. Uh, and, you know, we have we've, we, the Health Sciences Discovery Fund. We've got a lot of these little funds that are scattered all throughout the, the state departments. 
if we put them all under one umbrella, this consolidates government and makes for more efficiencies and better actual um, economies of scale for leveraging that money back into our local economies. One of the things that um, a bank can do that these lending funds cannot is that it can leverage. So what uh, is a mystery to many people uh, is this whole concept of fractional reserve lending. So while we have lending funds, they're just basically revolving lending funds. So you put a loan out, money comes back in that refunds the fund so that it can make more loans. Um, that's one way to do it, but if you've got a billion dollars in a fund to lend out, that's a billion dollars worth of a lending that you're capable of, plus interest re returned. The miracle of banking, just by the word bank, is that you can leverage the money. So a billion dollars in actual fund, you can leverage to actually $10 billion worth or even greater, depending on your risk tolerance. Um, but general banking principles are somewhere, I, th I think they're, they're lining up around nine to 10 times uh, leverage. A billion dollars worth of money set aside for capital construction, for instance, translates to $10 billion worth of work in the community. So when they say states are not the federal government, the states can't print money, actually we can on the books. That's how banking works. Every bank does that. So you can leverage that money that we appropriate for capital budget or for whatever, uh, leverage that back into the community for economic development. And you can, you can imagine the greater, much greater effect that that will have in making sure that the economy keeps going. Yeah, I know uh, Bank of America likes to advertise on their, on their commercials that they're investing uh, in local communities, but it seems if you actually look at the numbers, it's uh, anything but that. Yeah, yeah, I think that sort of bears that out. You just talk to anybody on the street, and that's where the real world is. And if they can't get a loan, you know, there is, there is money being lent, but most of that money is being lent to um, larger businesses. And so, you know, dollar-wise, yeah, money is being lent, but when they're going to large blue chips or whatever in the it, it's not really doing what we would like to see which is to support local communities and small businesses and small farmers so what hurdles do you see ahead for this what uh, is your plan going from here on out you said you just had a, a meeting here this last week yes our task force had its first meeting the major hurdle is to keep this as a nonpartisan issue. I've been working really hard to make sure that this does not become bogged down in partisan politics. Uh, you know, North Dakota um, is a very conservative state. Uh, it's run, uh, I think, both how both chambers of the legislature and the executive branch are all controlled by Republican Party. But you talk to anybody from North Dakota, and they are enormously proud. They actually take pride in their public institutions, uh, especially the Bank of North Dakota. So I'm trying to keep this as, as nonpartisan. That's probably the biggest hurdle is to try and keep people focused on what's in the best interests of the state of Washington and not get bogged down in partisan politics. The other big hurdle we're going to have is just the time crunch, you know, trying to get a proposal prepared for the 2012 legislature, you know, f to create a, inst a huge institution the size of a bank that can absorb, well, what our state revenues are $32 billion in a biennium. So um, this is not a small feat. And so, you know, we'll, we'll probably have to move into this thing incrementally um, and making those strategic decisions about where we want to start off and how we want to move forward, those are going to be uh, difficult decisions as well. How much of what uh, the Bank of North Dakota has done can be easily transferred over to our state? Um, easily? No. <laughs> That's a relative term. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Nothing in politics is easy. <laughs> uh, but that being said, you know, I think... Uh, 
we could do anything that the Bank of North Dakota can do. Uh, you know, obviously, Washington State's economy is much different um, than the North Dakota economy, which is primarily based on extractive resources and farming. Uh, Washington has a huge farming, um, agricultural, economic base. It's the largest industry in the state. Uh, but we don't have those types of extractive resources like North Dakota does. Um, we do have a lot of other resources, though, that um, that North Dakota does not have. So um, um, I think that we can do anything that the Bank of North Dakota can do. Uh, ju we just need to make sure that whatever we do meets the needs of Washington State. You know, and we can't just like rubber stamp what Bank of North Dakota did and say that it will work here. We need to be strategic about how we're going to implement this thing. And uh, how have uh, big banks responded to your proposal, uh, like Bank of America? Well, you know, they obviously were uh, knee-jerk opposed to it at the beginning, but uh, their primary concern is the competitive factor. So as long as we can stay on track in this non-compete thing, um, they surprisingly have moved off of their absolute resistance to wanting to work with us to see if there's a proposal that we can put forward in 2012 legislature. So um, I, I'm very hopeful that we can get to a point where uh, it won't meet that absolute brick wall resistance um, that would otherwise be there if we we're developing a competitive institution. All right. What message would you like to leave with listeners regarding this issue? The message, um, if you're interested in this, you can go to the website, um, but this is just one innovative concept in a larger revenue reform conversation I think the state needs to have. Um, you know, our parents taught us how to build America. Back in the day, the philosophy was those who get the most out of the system morally need to put the most back into the system. So the top tax rate post-World War II was about 91%. Now we've bought into this sort of trickle-down economics theory that we know doesn't work. Just look at the economy around us. You've got this whole divide between the haves and the have-nots that's growing, working class is disappearing. We need to go back to what works. We know what works. Our parents taught us how to build America, and that was with having adequate resources uh, so that we can build something for our grandchildren. We've gotten away from that. So this is part of that overall strategy on building resources for our grandchildren. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Mike, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for this.